The Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont. This evening, the DuPont Cavalcade brings you the story of John Gorey, doctor, scientist, and public benefactor, who perfected the first practical machine for making ice. Our story of science, which comes at the close of the broadcast, tells how chemistry makes time stand still. One of these lovely June days, you may say to yourself, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could stop the calendar right now and have the delights of summer all through the year? In a manner of speaking, that's just what has happened. Not as to weather, of course, but certainly as to other gifts of the summer season. And the part that chemical research plays in this juggling with time is another good example of the DuPont pledge, better things for better living through chemistry. As an overture, Don Voorhees and the DuPont Cavalcade Orchestra play When You're Away, from Victor Herbert's operetta, The Only Girl. DuPont Cavalcade moves forward. Born October 3rd, 1803 in Charleston, South Carolina, 
John Gorey went north for his medical education and practiced for a time in New York. When he was 30 years old, he settled in Apalachicola, Florida, and soon was known as the outstanding physician of the town. In 1838, he married Carolyn Beeman, who encouraged him in his study of tropical fever, which at that time was a great problem in Florida. In spite of all he could do, some years later his wife was stricken. We find him speaking to the nurse who was caring for her. How is she this afternoon, Miss Williams? About the same, Dr. Gary. I've just taken her temperature. Uh, let me see your record. It's bad, isn't it? Mm, yes. And you're so tired. You shouldn't have gone out. You, you were up all night with her. Uh, it doesn't matter. I couldn't rest. Today these people have needed me. New cases of fever are being reported every hour. Won't you go and rest now? I shan't leave, Mrs. Gary. I promise you. I'll rest after a while. You've given her the baths and the treatment? Yes, Doctor. Of course, there's no ice. I know. Some ice might relieve the suffering from this epidemic, at least. You think it's so important, Doctor? I think it's vital, both for prevention and cure. I'd give 20 years of my life for an unlimited supply of ice right now. I'm going in to see Mrs. Corey. John. John, is that you? Yes, dear. I'm at home now to stay. Uh, are there many sick, John? Very many. But I'm doing all I can. Mm. We'll beat this fever business yet. Oh, I'm so hot. I know, dear. Miss Williams will bathe you again presently. Isn't there any ice yet? Not yet, dear. The boat from the north is late. But it's expected soon. Poor John. After all your hard work... Now, you mustn't excite yourself, dear. Oh. Try and rest quietly, please. Mm. I, I wish I'd sent you north this spring. I had no right to keep you here. To endanger your life. I wouldn't have gone without you, John. I know your hopes. Your ambitions. You must stay here with, with your work, John. And I must stay with you. Yes, dear. I couldn't have gone on without you. Dr. Gorey. Yes? Mrs. Summers is here. The little girl is worse. Well, come in and stay with Mrs. Gorey till I get back. Yes, Doc. Mrs. Summers. Oh, Dr. Gorey, please. Please come quickly. Mary's worse. She's burning up with Have fever. Have you been using the baths and the ice, as I told you? Maybe that's what's wrong. I guess we had about the last piece of ice in town. And I've been using it so carefully. But this afternoon, while I was upstairs, someone stole it. At the request of the worried mother, Dr. Goy hurried to the little girl's bedside and did what he could to relieve her suffering. After the examination, he tries to reassure Mrs. Summers. Dr. Gorey, is she... Well, she... I've told you it's impossible to predict. Oh, Dr. Gorey, this terrible epidemic. Isn't there anything you can do? Nothing I'm not doing already. The doctors in this town are using every bit of skill at their command, Mrs. Summers. It just seems as though I can't bear it. Having Mitty so sick. Your little girl is one in hundreds. The whole city is stricken. And there isn't any way to escape? None that we're sure of. Then my other children may come down with it any minute. Oh, Dr. Gorey, there must be something I can do. The methods of prevention are still all experimental. I'll try anything. Anything to save my children from this wretched fever. Well, keep their beds covered with netting. And if we only had some ice... You could keep a block of ice in one corner of their room, in a basin, suspended above the floor. Ice? Well, what good can that do? I believe that cool, filtered air is a definite aid in cases of tropical fever, Mrs. Summers. However, we haven't any ice. And when it does come, every ounce is needed for those who are already sick. Well, can't anything be done about it? Yes, there are many things which can be done about it. I'm working on some of them now. But it takes time, time and patience. <laughs> The only thing we can do right now is to be brave, Mrs. Summers, and help others to be brave in this stricken city. Brave? It's all very well for you to talk of bravery. You're a doctor. You haven't someone you love dying with this terrible fever. Mrs. Summers, my wife was stricken two days ago. I left her to come here to your little girl. I'm going back to her now. Oh. 
Oh, then... Then you need ice for her, too, don't you? Right now, I seem to need ice more than anything else in the world. Oh, I... Come in. Is, is Dr. Gauri here? Yes? Well, Dr. Gauri, I just hurried from your home. My wife? No, sir, it wasn't about your wife. The nurse said to tell you that the boat's in from the north. The boat with the ice. Mrs. Gowrie's life was saved, but the desperate need of ice during her illness inspired in her husband a determination to discover some method of making it instead of depending upon nature's supply. As Dr. Gowrie sincerely believed that ice possessed curative powers in the treatment of fevers, he worked industriously Wait. to perfect well, the refrigerating machine. Apples. Don't keep long. Meanwhile, he Got continued his in medical April practice shower. and wrote extensively in medical journals. However, oh, his comments toward the perfection of an ice machine had to be suspended because of his interest in civic affairs. He served first as postmaster, then as member of the city council, and finally as director of the Pensacola Bank of Apalachicola. But he never forgot his plan to perfect an ice machine. One day, his nurse finds him working on his experiments in his office. Here is your list of calls, Dr. Gary. I've told the city hospital you will be there at 2. Very good. There is a council meeting this evening at 7.30. Mm-hmm. You know, Mrs. Williams, if I only had time, I'd rebuild this whole ice-making machine. The greatest difficulty is to get the ice out once it's frozen. Maybe if I made the openings larger at the top... Uh, let me take those plans now, Doctor. Your office hours... You see, are... it's nothing more than a pump, really. You simply compress air and cool it and allow it to expand quickly. My machine expands this air in a cooling chamber which is surrounded by water. In expanding, the air takes heat up quickly from surrounding objects, which means water in my machine... And this water freezes, and, well, we have ice. Dr. Gary, the waiting room is full of people, oh, and Dr. Yes, Chapman Oh, yes, of course, is... I am sorry. Whenever I get working on this thing, I forget about everything else. Well, uh, here, take these papers away. Now, who's first? There are a number of patients, but Dr. Chapman and several members of the council have been waiting to see you for quite a while. Chapman? Well, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> well, I did, Dr. Gary. <laughs> well, I must have been thinking about something else. I'm sorry. Please show them in at once. Will you come in, gentlemen? Oh, thank you, Miss Williams. Ah, uh, Dr. Chapman. Ah, good morning, John. Mr. Wood. Good morning, Doctor. Mr. Kane. Good morning, Doctor. Well, this is a surprise. I'm glad to see you all. Hey. Uh, won't you sit down, please? Hey, sit indeed. down. Well, now, what's on your mind, eh? You all look very official. Well, to tell the truth, we are. I've come with these gentlemen because they believed our long friendship made me a proper spokesman for what they've come to say, but... Perhaps you would lend a more willing ear to someone else. <laughs> I've listened to you for many years, Dr. Chapman, and it's too late to stop now. <laughs> well, I've argued many points with you and often lost, but this time I can't lose. I wouldn't be too sure, but fire away. Well, in the first place, I've been asked to express to you the gratitude of the city of Apalachicola for all that you have done in bettering conditions here, for your suggestions which have made it the third cotton port on the Gulf. I only suggested... You suggested that we dredge the channel. You suggested that we build solid walls and foundations for buildings, that we fill in our streets and that we get rid of our swamps. And that was only common sense. If it was, you were the only one who had it, Dr. Gordy. I honestly believe that if it had not been for your article, the one you wrote for the land company, explaining that the difficulties and bad health conditions were not permanent... This city would be a deserted village today instead of a thriving port. I love this town, gentlemen, and believe in it. And it loves you and believes in you. That is why I have come here, John. We know how overworked you are, your patience, your position on the council, your civic activities, all your charity work at city hospitals. Yes, I am busy. And, of course, there's my ice machine. Oh, oh yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> But in spite of all that... We are asking you to assume one more responsibility, John. One which you and you alone are qualified to fill. You've been our leader unofficially for some time. Now we want you to be our leader officially. John, we want you to become mayor of Apalachicola. <laughs> Dr. 
Dr. Gori laid aside his personal interests for the welfare of his city and in 1837 was elected mayor of Apalachicola. But he was convinced of the possibility of an ice-making machine and the constant need for it in the Florida climate spurred him on. For 10 years he worked whenever he had time to perfect his invention. Among the few in his confidence was Monsieur Rosin, the French consul. On July 14th, 1850, Bastille Day, Monsieur Rosin gave a dinner at the famous old mansion house. We find Monsieur Rosin in conversation with John Sharon, proprietor of the mansion house, in the latter's office. Oh, the schooner from New York is late as usual. That means we have no ice for the wines. Monsieur Rosin, I cannot tell you how sorry I am. It is of no matter, no matter. I have provided all that. You have provided? The ice, my dear Sharon, the ice. But how can you? With the help of my good friend, Dr. Gory, I have arranged it. He will tell you when he comes. Oh, Dr. Gory. Excuse me, gentlemen. Sorry if I'm late. No, no, come in, Dr. Gory, come in. I was just explaining to Monsieur Sharon that if the ice does not arrive, you will make some to cool the wine. Gladly. Enough to cool all the wine in Apalachicola. Well, what is this, a joke? (laughs) No joke. Dr. Gory has a secret method of his own. What, for making eyes? Man-made eyes? Nonsense, it can't be done. Uh, You would not like to make a wager on that, would you? Of course. Say, five dollars. I can't lose. John, Dr. Gory, you won't fail me. (laughs) No, indeed. You will have your eyes. (laughs) Have you frozen all your patients yet? Not quite. But I have provided ice for all those who needed it. Well, gentlemen, will you please explain? You will see. But uh, come into the dining room, gentlemen. By all means. Well, I see my guests are all assembled. They've been waiting for the last 20 minutes. Ah, uh, greetings to you all. Greetings, sir. Please make yourself thoroughly at all. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let us take our places. Eh? Uh, Dr. Gar, you will sit at my right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wood at my left. Thank you. Mr. Ken next. Thank you. And Dr. Chapman here. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen... You are my guest this evening to celebrate that great historic occasion, Bastille Day. In spite of the fact that the boat has not arrived from the north with the ice, some of my guests have expressed the wish that the wine for this occasion may be properly cooled. Uh, John Sharon here, proprietor of the mansion house, has regretfully told me that that is impossible. And upon my declaring my intention of uh, producing ice at any cost, has made me a wager that this is impossible also. But, but gentlemen, I have given my word. Ice you shall have if it takes a miracle. Uh, Uh, Monsieur Director, start the parade. <laughs> Look there, the waiters are all marching in. And each of them has a tray with a glass block on it. <laughs> oh, I see it's a joke. <laughs> glass it is, glass. Well, of course it is. See how clear it is. You're wrong. Glass. It's clear, all right, but this is glass. Why, it's real ice. Uh, real ice. ice. George, I believe he's trying to get ice. It's impossible. It's impossible. Here it is, my friends. Ice, manufactured ice, all you can use. Ice made just for you. Monsieur Rosa, oh. do you mean to tell me that this ice is is manufactured? That it was made by a machine? It most certainly was. Amazing. Well, I never After life. years of work, the ice manufacturing machine is no longer a dream. It is an accomplished fact. And your deaf fellow townsman is responsible for this miracle of science. Ladies and gentlemen, a toast to Dr. John Goy, who stands here today as the inventor of the first practical ice-making machine in the world. Dr. Goy had demonstrated the possibility of making ice by machine but he found it very difficult to place his invention on the market. During the last years of his life, he became so absorbed in the enterprise that he virtually abandoned the practice of medicine. But his own health was failing, 
and discouragements awaited him on every hand. He traveled north and made trips to New Orleans to secure funds for putting his ice machine on the market. But one after another of his plans for obtaining the necessary capital failed. One morning, as he lies ill, his wife leans over him. Karen. Karen. Yes, dear, what is it? Has no mail arrived yet? Not yet, dear. It's still early. It's strange. Strange that I don't hear from Boston. Karen, they've promised to finance the manufacture of the ice machine. They've, they've promised. Oh, John, please don't excite yourself, darling. It not only makes you worse. Uh, yes, I, I suppose so. <laughs> it's very difficult being a patient after having been the physician all these years. Let me fix your pillow, dear. Yeah. There. Yeah. Is that better? Oh, yes. Oh, you are good to me, my dear. Are the children here? They're both in the living room. Do you want them? No. John is going to be a brilliant man, Carolyn. And Sarah, well, she's an angel, just like you. John. They'll be a comfort to you. To, to both of us, John. Well, I won't share in it very long, Carolyn. Oh, John, don't. Well, we may as well face it. <laughs> now, don't cry. I didn't want to upset you. Oh, you mustn't. You mustn't talk that way. Carolyn, we both realize that I shall never get well. Oh, John, that isn't true. You know it isn't true. And the doctors say and The it. doctors may fool you, Carolyn, but I'm a doctor myself. I know. Oh, John. Oh, don't believe. It has been a good life, Carolyn. And a full one. If only... If only I might feel that I'd left behind me something permanent. Something that would benefit humanity. Oh, you have, John. You have. You've done so much. No one can ever forget you. Oh, people are forgotten so easily, my dear. I've lived for some time now on hope. It'll mean a great deal to me. If this Boston deal goes through, Fletcher and Sage of the solicitors have promised to communicate with me about the plans for manufacturing the ice machine. Uh, there's a client of theirs, a wealthy man who will put up the capital. Uh, Carolyn. Yes, dear. Would you see if there's been any mail? Yes, of course. John. Yes, Mother. Has the mail come yet? It just came. It is. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, son. Uh, Carolyn is. Is there a letter? Yes, dear, there is. A letter from the solicitors. Here. I'll open it for you. Yes. There. Read it yourself. Oh, Carolyn, I... I'm almost afraid. If, if it's the news I think it is, my dream has come true. They'll start making my machines at once. Sick people, well people, anybody can have ice anywhere in the world. Yes, dear. Yeah. Let's see now. Let's see what they say. Oh. What is it? Uh, what is it, John? What's the matter, Father? Uh, all right. Here, let me read it. Uh, yes. Uh, Yours of the 21st. Oh, John. Huh? What? Here, let me. Because of the sudden death of the client who had volunteered to finance the manufacture of your ice-making machine... We are unable to continue with the plans we have outlined to you for the development of... Oh, John, darling. Oh. They aren't going to do it. I'll never live now to see it really happen. Oh, John. You mustn't lose faith. Lose faith? No. That's all that's left. They can't take that away from me. I still believe in it, Carolyn. I'll go on believing in it forever. Dr. John Gorey died June 16, 1855. It wasn't until almost half a century later that the world paid tribute to his greatness. Public funds 
and subscriptions of ice manufacturing associations throughout the country went towards the erection of a monument in the municipal square at Apalachicola to Dr. Gauri. The Southern Ice Exchange were particularly desirous of so honoring Dr. Gauri's memory because his invention made the ice manufacturing industry possible. This evening, DuPont salutes Dr. John Gauri as a leader in the cavalcade of America. In homes throughout the land where folks enjoy fresh strawberries on Christmas Day and fresh corn or peas in January, little thought is given to chemistry. But the chemist really made these things possible. It's all part of the story of quick frozen foods, the amazing new process that brings you fresh meat, vegetables, and fruit, in season or out of season. It's a contribution of chemistry that's likely to revolutionize the eating habits of the world. Strawberries are a good example to use because they are one of the most popular single items in the rapidly growing list of fresh frozen foods. Each year at the height of the strawberry season, when the berries are at the perfect point of ripeness, science captures that delicious ripeness and holds it safe for you until you're ready to enjoy strawberries. It takes a sudden icy shock to perform this miracle. And chemical refrigerants make the quick freezing possible at shivery temperatures 25 degrees or more below zero. The mere freezing of foods isn't a new idea, but quick freezing at these sub-zero Arctic temperatures is a modern invention of great importance to everyone. The difference is a matter of ice crystals. Fruits, vegetables, fish, and meat are made of tiny cells like a honeycomb that can be seen only under a microscope. These cells are full of liquid, which contains the nutritious mineral salts and flavor of the food. If freezing is done at temperatures from 25 to 30 degrees above zero, the liquid in the cells turns into large, jagged ice crystals that grow rapidly until they burst the tiny cells. And when defrosting or thawing out takes place, the flavor and goodness leak away. Modern quick freezing, however, is entirely different. By plunging the temperature rapidly downward way below zero, entirely different ice crystals are formed tiny and fragile. They pack tightly inside the cells and don't break the cell walls. Instead, they preserve and protect all the fresh, delicious taste and nutritional value of the food. Today, more than 50 varieties of foods, from peaches and berries, string beans and broccoli, to beefsteak, seafoods, and chicken, are quick frozen at the moment of their choicest condition. In the case of fruits and vegetables, this takes place right on the farm through the use of portable freezers and traveling crews of experts. Then the foods are shipped in a packing of dry ice, another chemical product, to central storage plants, where below zero temperatures are maintained constantly. Thus, refrigeration makes time stand still to give your appetite enjoyment. And among the better things for better living furnished by DuPont chemists, the refrigerating chemicals that make this possible take high rank. This year is being celebrated as the tercentenary anniversary of the coming of the Swedish colonists to America. The landing of the Swedes in Delaware dramatizing this important event will be the subject of our broadcast when next week at the same time, DuPont again presents The Cavalcade of America. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.